Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, sir. President Taneja, Provost Dr. Sina, dignitaries on the dais, students, graduating students, parents, faculty, staff, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to be here on this momentous occasion of fifth convocation function of GSFC. And thank you for inviting me to share my views. I had prepared a speech, which in your, already in your inbox, in the email, uh, but listening to various speakers, seeing all of you, and when Dr. Sina talked about the Devang Mehta Award, I had decided to speak on a very different subject. So you have my speech, please read it at leisure whenever you get time. How many of you know Devang? See, that's a sad story, frankly. From the perspective that everyone's future today is so bright. And if he had not contributed, probably we wouldn't be here. India would have broken up into multiple countries. If you go back in the, let's say, early, late 80s and early 90s, we were bankrupt on foreign exchange. If you wanted to buy a scooter to come to college, you place the order when you are in the college, it will be delivered when you are married and you have two children. You want to have eat fruits, your parents will say, let's go to Kashmir. The country was, there were shortages, there were riots all over. And we were known as a snake charmer's country, fakir's country. From there, we have emerged today as a global tech powerhouse. We are, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. How did it happen? Was it by accident? Was it by luck? And I'm putting my stake on the ground saying no. It was the hard work of millions of engineers working day and night over the last 35 years. <laughs> now, let me give you some statistics here. I talked about the 1990 scenario. Today, our industry has $250 billion of revenue. We earn more foreign exchange than Saudi Arabia earns. The difference is, in Saudi Arabia, money goes in one account, while in India, through thousands of companies in millions of accounts. So that, and that has created a new middle class uh, in the country. Our industry employs 5.2 million people. And these are each job is a high paying job. Each job creates additional four to five jobs in the society. So if you put these two numbers together in an average family of four, today our industry supports twice the population of UK. Now if you look at corporate governance, how did the FTI money started flowing in India? How did we build India brand as a trusted nation? Our industry took the initiative in corporate reporting, which is you can call it transparency, in the quarterly reports and the annual reports. That created confidence, investing in the Indian companies. And our industry took the lead, and then the rest of the corporate world uh, followed. If you look at meritocracy, today, or not today, I would say 20 years back even, IIT Bombay's Gardner's son became software engineer. And he became a software engineer not because he knew someone to get a job, but because he knew the software engineering as a subject, he appeared for the test and he got the job. Now, you extend that logic to women. You talked about Dr. Taneja, 42% women. Now, today our industry employs 37% women. Almost two million women engineers. These are all high paying jobs. Now just imagine when this money is in their hands today, how they are going to bring up their children, how they are going to contribute to the community and to the society. Um, I see a silent revolution taking pl place uh, behind the scenes. So that's the kind of change you can say our industry has brought in and uh, uh, bringing in. Now, in spite of such a success, now let's, how did it happen? I said, talked talk about it. So Dr. Sumantra Gosal of London School of Economics, he used to say, 
that the thousand years of downward spiral of India, Mughal Raj and the British Raj, was arrested by the IT industry of India. NASCOM was the sutrada driving that change. And who was the man in charge of NASCOM? Devang Mehta. And where was he born? Just an hour away from here at Umbrit. And we all have forgotten. So the individual who made that significant change in everyone's life. So it's something we need to ponder upon in terms of saying, how do we preserve such history? Because history is what will tell us how do you extrapolate in the future. And it's very critical from my perspective that this history is not uh, forgotten, especially with the people who have really uh, contributed uh, significantly. Now, let's talk about some of the specific things. Why I'm saying that in NASCOM change IT industry. Our IT industry changing India is one part of the story. But why NASCOM change? What is the secret sauce of NASCOM that made that change happen? So I want to tell you a couple of three, four stories here. And I'm sure you'll be able to draw lessons from these stories. Because some of you are in fire and safety. Some of you are in chemical engineering. Some of you are in biotech. In each industry, these stories has value in terms of if you implement in your own segments, I think you will see a remarkable change in terms of how India would change uh, in the years to come. So let me start with the first story, which is in the 1990, I would say, when we used to approach a prospect in the USA, he would look at us as a thief. Because in India, we believe in right to copy, not in copyright. Now with that mindset, they were con very, really worried that if they part with their data and uh, programs to us, we will go and sell it to somebody else in the marketplace. So they were not trusting us. Now, what do you do? So as an industry, we decided that we need to have a stringent copyright act. The word software was not even there in the copyright act. So we approached the government officers. And so one officer said, where is our Kohinoor? So we are all scratching our head and say, Kohinoor, it's in the Tower of London. Where is all this Indian jewelry? It's it, again, different museums in London. So he said, Western world has looted us for 300 years. Now it's our time to loot them. It's our time to pirate their software. And it's, so why should we give protection to that software. That was the mindset of the bureaucrats or the policy makers at that point in time. Some, but another officer said, we don't charge any royalty for Ramayan. We don't charge any royalty for Mahabharat. Arya Bhatta invented zero. We have we charged royalty? So if we have not charged, why should the Western world charge royalty to us for their software products? Anyway, so that was an environment where we were lucky to have as Mr. Officer like Taneja at DOE, one Mr. Whittle, he understood the logic. He said, this problem has to be solved if India wants to improve its brand. Otherwise, no one will do business with India. So he modified the act, added the word software, but he went a little beyond. And he added seven days of jail to the CEO of a company where the pirated software would be found. So we told Mr. Vital, no, no, we are, our interest is not to take the, just make it in so seven days, just take the CEO to the police station. That's all we want. Just create a fear in their mind that don't use pirated software. We have no interest in putting him behind bar. But that, once they agreed, and that Copyright Act at that time was more stringent than the UK. That started building India Inc. brand. Now, how do you get such an act passed by the both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha in those days. Devang Mehta gave a presentation to every political party of India. Talked about why this has to be done, what does it mean to India, how, how will it earn foreign action, how it will create jobs and what not. And so when it came to Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, the entire act was sailed through. Didn't have any political uh, connotation attached uh, to it. So that's one uh, segment. The second segment I want to talk about is NASCOM has a model where I call it Maverick Effect. What it means is fierce competitors sit together, solve industry issues, 
keeping India first with single voice, being consensus, and their creative juices flowing to solve the problems. Now, let me give one example here. Again, in early 90s, multinational MNCs, I'm sure many of you would have got a job with MNCs today in India. Uh, These MNCs wanted to come to India with 100% ownership to run back office operations. But when we sub uh, proposal came to NASCOM Executive Council, we started discussing and say, do should we allow or not allow? Now, protection is a very natural instinct. It's already government has given you indirectly a protection. So why do you want to invite them to come to India? We are also worried that they come, if they come to India, they will take away our people paying twice the salary. We are also worried that the existing business that we are doing will get shifted to back office. So there's one group of, you can say, CEOs of IT industry who are not in favor of allowing them to come in. But in, in the, those three, four years, we had built a trusted environment within the uh, executive council, and we are allowing individuals to speak freely in these meetings. Doesn't matter what your size is or what your celebrity uh, quotient is. Every small voice had a, we can say, be heard uh, by everyone. So at that same time, there was a challenge. There was a uh, debate in the USA. Okay, who is us? That time they were debating whether IBM, Motorola, Whirlpool is us, or is it Sony, Panasonic, uh, Canon, whatever other Japanese companies who had made big inroads in the USA? They are us. Who is us? So that same question came up in our meeting. Okay, who is us? Who is NASCOM? Are we India-based companies? Are we NRI-based companies also? Are we MNCs or not? So again, in that conversation, somebody said, whoever develops human capital of India is us, and who doesn't is not us. And that, I, I will tell you that we went around again, Mr. Kohli of TCA, Munaran Murthy of Infosys, Azim Premji of Vipro, everybody else, we said, do you agree with this proposal of allowing MNCs to come in? They all said yes. They were not afraid of, as an industry, we were not afraid of competition, global competition. As a matter of fact, we thought we will learn from that competition. We will learn the, their quality processes. We will learn their best practices. And we can replicate, and then we'll go and compete with them uh, outside. So that's the confidence we had, and that's the kind of, we can say, the value system we had. Okay, we were prepared to take on competition at our own ground. And that decision that we took of uh, allowing MNCs to come in, today, that segment, there are now 1,500 R&D centers in the country. They employ 1.2 million software engineers, software hardware uh, engineers. They earn today $35 billion of foreign exchange for India. And that today, the kind of work they are doing is most advanced work they are doing for their parent companies in India. And not only that, they are now, rep some of them are representing at the board level of these Fortune 500 companies, co-creating future for those companies. That's the contribution of this segment. That is the contribution of that simple decision in one way, which took a year for, uh, for us to come to. But having those, that courage, having com tough competitors uh, collaborating, Keeping India first, because that was in India's interest. Today also, whenever we are doubtful about taking a dis uh, business decision, we use, will it help, will it help develop human capital of India? Becomes a sort of a reference point for us to take the decision. It's very easy now because everybody would agree uh, with that logic. Third story I would like to tell you that Maverick Effect in Action, that is about, many of you know about Satyam crisis. So, a letter came out from Mr. Ramalanga Raju admitting his fraud. Now, after the letter came out, Som Mittal, who was the president of NASCOM at that point, he called a meeting of all the, our executive council. He said, what do we do? Should we intervene or not? Because the it, it, company was almost, you can say, on the verge of collapsing with that, that sort of size of fraud uh, being uh, disclosed. Because normally, as a you can say, non-profit association, we say, 
Why should we worry about the company? It's the auditor's job to see that this fraud don't occur. Or it is the independent director's job to see that this fraud don't occur. Or it is the shareholder's job. Who are we? Why should we get into it? If there are weaknesses in each of that sector, somebody, government and everyone has to work together to fix it, but we cannot afford to not work at it. Then the discussion continued and we realized that Satyam had few customers, which were telecom operators in USA, uh, sorry, in Australia, and banks in USA. Okay, those applications would have collapsed. If those applications had collapsed, it would have created I would say millions of customers on the road in some way. So then we realized okay, if these mission critical applications which Satyam is supporting collapses, India Inc. brand will get a big hit. And these customers will never ever give a business to India. India will get positioned as a fraudulent country, X, Y, and Z. So we, we realized serious attack in some sense on the India Inc. brand's reputation. So we decided that we must save Satyam. We should contribute in that direction. So immediately Swam Mittal called Mr. Gupta, who was the Corporate Affairs Minister. That Mr. Gupta called Kamal Nath and other ministers in that meeting. And Swam explained, their reaction was, why should we get into it? Like us. But when they realized that it is India Inc. brand, and the industry's future is at stake, they said, we'll get back to you. Then they talked to the PM and came back to us after two days saying, government has agreed to save Satyam. However, we need to change certain laws and whatnot, and taking over a company has never been done in the history of India. So it will take us, a while, take us a while. So we need some breathing period. Meanwhile, you make sure that Satyam survives. So again, we called a meeting. At that time, one of us said, this is a golden opportunity, marketing 101. You go like a vulture and kill that company, take away the nice pieces, good people, and double your business. Why not? What is wrong in that? That's what marketing teaches us. So there are many who are reluctant to abide by, saying that they will not touch Satyam. But the collective wisdom of the people prevailed. And we, in that jointly, we decided at that point that we will not proactively recruit any senior manager from Satyam for the next 45 days. We will not go after proactively after any customer of Satyam for the next 45 days. It was self-voluntary imposition by all of us. And that allowed eventually government to take over and it was auctioned and sold to uh, take Mohindra. Now this success story or this kind of story is nowhere in the world where industry has come forward and saved a company. Now, what does it mean, all this? It's good, great stories. It great stories mean just give one, one example that China wanted to compete with India. So they appointed Forrester's John McCarthy as a, who's the CEO of uh, John McCarthy at that, that point in time. That you give us a master plan <clears throat> to take, not only beat India in IT services, but we become number one in the world. And you know China, I mean, once they go after it, they go after it. John McCarthy told the state minister or whoever the ministry that was driving it from China saying, you cannot compete with IT services of India until you create NASCOM equivalent association on your side. <laughs> now, just imagine India indirectly by working together avoided a major competitor entering the space. And how do you value that? So anyway, so these are some few stories I wanted to share with you about how industry came up with various changes. Uh, like I talked about Devang, for example. When he joined NASCOM, he was 29 years old. Just almost a few years later, you can become another Devang. And he contributed. At the age of 32, 33, he was giving presentations. Maulik is here, he knows about it, the story of Devan. That we, or let's say, he gave a presentation to 20 state chief ministers and got the draft IT policy approved by them. And eventually, they become 20 state IT policies. So when the waves and waves of technologies came for as an opportunity, be it Java, open source, 
uh, internet, smartphone. Many universities already in started training the people in these technologies. So partly you can say the raw materials available for our industry uh, to grow. So that's the kind of contribution we can make. So as I talked about from that perspective, that when you grow up or when you join the company, my recommendation you would, to you would be, just like NASCOM, at the peak of your career, you should spend some time, maybe 10% of your time, in growing the ecosystem of the business that you are in. You work collaboratively, selflessly, to build an ecosystem. Because if the ecosystem grows, everyone who is in, in the industry grows, plus it allows large number of new companies uh, to take birth. And once that happens, it becomes a very powerful uh, business segment. So that would be my re recommendation to all of you, that invest 10% of your time building your own industry. With that suggestion, I think I wish you all the best. You guys have a bright future ahead. Thank you very much.